as we continue on to the parts of the nervous system, now we go into the midbrain, uh, develops from the mesencephalon. Uh, the cerebral aqueduct passes through it, uh, central periaqueductal gray matter. Uh, the tectum is the posterior aspect. The tectal plate, you have these corpora quadrigeminas, which are four little bulges. Uh, you have the superior colliculi that will uh, do vision and inferior colliculi that is responsible for hearing. So let's say you're walking down the street and you hear a jackhammer all of a sudden and you turn towards that stimuli. Well, that inferior colliculi is the reason that you would turn towards that loud noise. Cerebral peduncles, anterior aspect, uh, tegenton with red nucleus. The substantia nigra is what degenerates into Parkinson's disease. Okay, Cerebral crura, anchor cerebrum to the brainstem. And then <clears throat> the midbrain also gives rise to cranial nerves three and four. So here's a cross section of the spinal cord, which we'll discuss in a little bit, but you can see the white matter and the gray matter. Okay, so white matter and gray matter and lateral columns. The cerebellum is the cauliflower shaped. Okay, now you have <clears throat> one cerebellum but it has a little vermis which separates the lobes you have an anterior lobe posterior lobe and you have one cerebellar hemisphere here and another cerebellar hemisphere here so the purpose of the cerebellum is actually uh, quite important because it really helps with balance and coordination um, so you have all these and you have, inside you'll have this what's just called the arbor vitae remember in spanish arbolus is tree vitae is life so tree of life that's the arbor vitae that's white matter and the deep nuclei are, are gray matter again the cerebellum is situated on the posterior surface of the brain stem descending input into the cerebellum enters the large white matter structure of the pons Ascending input from the periphery and spinal cord enters through the fibers of the inferior olive. Okay, right through here. Output goes to the midbrain, which sends a descending signal to the spinal cord. So very important to for balance and coordination, the cerebellum. Now, if somebody has issues with the cerebellum, they're going to have what we call a cerebellar ataxic gait. So the signs are dysarthria, dysmetria, dysdiokinesia, intentional tremors, nystagmus, Ronberg's. Okay, so description is a wide, staggering uh, base, and I'll show you what this gait pattern looks like. Um, you have cerebellar degeneration, stroke, MS, thiamine, vitamin B12 deficiency, and we also call this the drunken gait. So <laughs> the cerebellar ataxic gait. So if you've ever been uh, really drunk, then you know that, hey, this gait may look... Uh, uh, quite familiar to you. So let me show you. There's different kinds of date patterns. Uh, uh, sensory ataxia, uh, uh, impaired position, vestibular ataxia, such as Meniere's, and there's that cautious gait when people get older, that's just deconditioning. But really that cerebellar ataxia is what I want to show you. How does input and output occur? Well, the muscles send out output and then goes to the spinal cord spinal cord it has sensory information the cerebellum the cerebellum sends information back to the eye and the inner ear and coordinates balance you have output and then the cerebellum can give output to the brain or it can give output to the legs and adjust it based on that so there's all this input sensory information the cerebellum will help coordinate and fine-tune this so here's a little table that pretty much summarizes everything that we've talked about so far uh, the medulla oblongata again it's there for speech coughing sneezing salivation swelling gagging vomiting sweating gi secretions movements of the tongue and the head the pons uh, um, pretty much controls chewing swallowing eye movements middle and inner ear reflexes facial expression secretion of tears and saliva um, the midbrain uh, really visual reflexes, movement of the eyes, gazing objects, uh, auditory signals, the thalamus. So really looking at this would be beneficial to say, okay, what does the medulla do? What does the pons do? And what does the midbrain do? The cerebellum, again, it does muscular coordination, fine motor control, muscle tone, posture, equilibrium, judging passage of time. 
some involvement in emotion, processing tactile input, spatial perception, and language. Cerebellum's huge. Love the cerebellum. But if something goes wrong with the cerebellum, that's when problems, big time problems. Again, the medulla oblongata, centers for circulatory and respiratory control, sensory motor functions for the head and the neck, the pons, facial sensation expression, control of chewing, respiration, and sleep, the midbrain, red nucleus, substantia nigra, superior colliculus for visual attention, and inferior colliculus for auditory attention. Okay. Reticular formation, that's your sleep and consciousness, uh, paired sensory motor involuntary, the cerebellum is muscular coordination and fine motor control. The diencephalon, that's very important, that's where the thalamus, hypothalamus, and the epithalamus are. So diencephalon, composed primarily of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. So what is the thalamus? Well, it's a large ovoid mass that makes up four-fifths of the diencephalon. It's an interthalamic adhesion, which has an intermediate mass, which connects the right and left thalamus. Basically, it's a gateway to the cerebral cortex. I call it the air traffic control, or you can call it the router. So involved in sensation, movement, memory, and emotion. So all this stimuli will basically come to the thalamus, and the thalamus will basically direct it which way it wants to go into the cerebral cortex. Okay, so it's like air traffic control. All the planes are landing, and the air traffic control will tell you where to go at which gate, and then it'll tell the planes at the gate when to take off. Okay. The hypothalamus right here, that pretty much does homeostasis, and that means it extends from the optic chiasma. Okay, here's the optic chiasma right down here, and the hypothalamus will be right in here. Okay. And it's a major control center of the autonomic nervous system. So what does it do? Hormone secretion, such as oxytocin, not oxycontin. Autonomic effects, heart rate, blood pressure, thermal regulation, food and water intake, hunger, sleep and circadian rhythms, emotional responses, your sex drive, memory, new memories between the hippocampus and cortex. So the hypothalamus is like one of the most important aspects of your brain. So I would know this inside and out. Say, what does the hypothalamus do? It does all this. Now, speaking of the circadian rhythm, let's talk a little bit about this. Um, this is also uh, regulated by the pineal gland and really most people should be on this circadian rhythm here. Okay, so the lowest body temperature is around 4.30 in the morning. Your sharpest rise in blood pressure around, around 6.45. That's why most heart attacks are happen in the morning. Uh, melatonin secretion stops and you all of a sudden wake up, right? So those that don't set the alarm, 7.30, you're, you're kind of up. Uh, your bowel movement is likely around 8, 8.30, so you wake up, brush your teeth, maybe you, you go poop, maybe you eat breakfast, then you go poop. Uh, you're like, uh, well, I have class at 8.30, Patel, I don't have time to go poop. Well, okay, then you miss out and you hold it and you get constipated. But most likely you want to go in the morning. Uh, the highest testosterone secretion is around 9, so you can either go work out or make babies, <laughs> whatever you want to do, right? Uh, your highest alertness is around 10, so you should take your most challenging classes at 10, not 7 o'clock at night. Uh, 12 noon, go eat some lunch. Your best coordination is around 2.30. That's why after school sports uh, uh, work really well at 2.30. Fastest reaction time is around 3.30. Uh, your greatest cardiovascular efficiency and muscle strength is around 5 o'clock. So going to the gym at 5, uh, that's also good. You don't always have to go early in the morning. You actually are... Uh, pretty efficient uh, from a cardiovascular standpoint or muscle going to the gym at four or five in the afternoon is actually or five or six might be good before dinner. Okay, your highest blood pressure and highest body temperature are, are, occur around 730. Okay. Melatonin starts to secrete, you get a little sleepy around 10. And then <clears throat> after about 10 30 9 9 30 10 you probably don't want to have too many bowel movements unless <clears throat> you had six tacos for a dollar from del taco or tj then you might have bowel movements all night <laughs> uh, the epithalamus is the pineal gland that's what we just talked about which uh, regulates your circadian rhythm the habanula 
is the relay from the limbic system to the midbrain. Okay. Now the cerebrum itself, the, the, the brain itself, it derives from the embryonic telling self to the forebrain. It, what does the cerebrum do? Well, it allows you to turn pages, read and comprehend words, remember ideas, talk about them, take exams. So those are, there's two cerebral hemispheres that are separated by the longitudinal cerebral fissure. Uh, they're connected by the corpus callosum. It's a great quiz question. So the corpus callosum uh, connects the cerebral hemispheres. The gyri and the sulci produce large surface area. Uh, the lobes of the cerebrum, what do they do? So this is very important for you to know. So the frontal lobe, from the frontal lobe to the central sulcus, it does cognition, speech, and motor control. The parietal lobe, from the central sulcus to the right, it interprets signals of general senses and taste. What does the occipital lobe do from the parietal occipital sulcus to occipital bone? It's the principal visual center. The temporal lobe is for hearing, smell, learning, and memories. The insula, which is deep to the lateral sulcus, that's taste, visceral sensation, and language. Now, if you look at the lobes again, if you look at the frontal lobe, and the reason these are important is that let's say you had damage to the frontal lobe, you had damage to the parietal lobe, or damage to the cerebral lobe, then you would know what kind of things that you would see in a patient, or if they had a stroke that involved the frontal lobe, a stroke that involved the occipital lobe. Okay, so frontal lobe, abstract thought, explicit memory, mood, motivation, foresight and planning, decision making, emotional control, social judgment, uh, uh, voluntary motor control, and speech production. So, you know, going back and talking about alcohol, when you have your first drink, uh, going passing the blood brain barrier, it goes first to the frontal lobe. So a lot of times your mood will change, uh, emotional control, your social judgment. You might ask a guy or a gal that you didn't want to ask out when you're sober. You might ask them out this time. Uh, um, if it goes, continues to go, let's say you have two drinks, your speech production might get a little slurred, your, right? Then if you continue to drink, well, it might go into the parietal lobe where your taste, you're like, you might oversalt your food, right? Uh, your sensory integration, visual processing, your spatial perception, this is where you fall off stage because you're drunk. Uh, language processing, uh, numerical awareness, you're like, well, what time is it? Or this is when you go out to drink with uh, your uh, fellow uh, mates and you're like, ah, oh, the everybody spits a bill 20 and you're, you put in 100 because you're just drunk and you, you're you like, I don't know, just just tell me what uh, what I owe, right? Occipital lobe, that's visual awareness. This is where you can uh, do some major damage. You could fall because you can't see straight. And then the temporal lobe, that's hearing, smell, emotion, learning, memory consolidation, verbal memory. Uh, you don't remember what happened, right? So um, that's not good. That's four or five drinks an hour. Um, then if you keep drinking and it goes into the insula, this is on animal instincts alone. Basically, you're all sense, everything's pretty much shut down. Your sense of taste, pain, and consciousness. So this is where you pass out. Okay. So once the, the alcohol reaches the insula, that's where you pass out, unfortunately. And if you continue to drink, uh, uh, um, some people can override this. And if you continue to drink, we'll go into your midbrain and pons, and then you'll die. <laughs> Just, I just say the facts. All right, cerebral white matter, projection tracks travel vertically to carry information between the cerebrum and rest of the body. Commissure tracks, commissures across between two hemispheres. The corpus callosum is the largest. Remember, the corpus callosum connects the right and left hemisphere. The cerebral cortex, which is the surface of the hemispheres, is 40% of the mass of the brain. Pyramidal cells, triangle shaped with apex pointing to the brain. Output neurons of the cerebrum. That limbic system, kind of important. Prominent parts include the cingulate, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. Important functions of emotion and learning. Uh, contains multiple gratification and aversion centers. So we like the limbic system. The basal nuclei, which are deep masses of cerebral gay matter, consist of caudate nucleus, putamen, and the globus pallidus. It's involved in motor control. Okay, the major components, the basal nuclei. Now, are you a genius? All right, continue from the top 10. Well, when you're upset, you know what's bothering you. Uh, sometimes you talk to yourself and you hate background noise. It's just, it just bothers the heck out of you. 
And your number one sign you're a genius, your handwriting is terrible and messy. So most of you are geniuses in this class because your handwriting is terrible. <laughs> All right. Now let's try to integrate this stuff. You have the primary cortex. The primary sensory cortex is the first cortical region to receive input for that sense. You have a primary motor cortex issues projection fibers to distribute motor commands. Then you have an association cortex, any cortical area that is not primary. Interpretation of sensations, thought, memory, and motor planning. Okay, so these are how you integrate, how the brain processes this information. You have all these cortexes. Can you see this? In the chat, go ahead and put the number there. Yeah. All right, so again, uh, some functions of the cerebral cortex. The vision does the cipital lobe, primary visual cortex. Hearing, temporal lobe and the insula. Primary auditory cortex. Equilibrium is the cerebellum. Taste is the parietal lobe. Smell is the temporal and frontal lobes. Now, this is important for you to know. You have the primary somatosensory uh, area, which is the postcentral gyrus, which is right in here. Okay, so this is part of the brain right here. This is where your sensory information product. Look how much is dedicated to your tongue, your face, your hands. This is all how much is dedicated to your hands, your tongue, and your face. Um, how much is involved in the abdominum? And you would think that, oh, the genitalia and the foot are evenly matched here, okay? The hips. But if you look at what most of the sensation comes from, it's your tongue, your face, and your hands. Now, motor control, where do we have most of our motor control? Remember, look at the hand. It's amazing. That's what makes us the opposable thumb is what gives us that fine motor control. So, so much is dedicated just to our hand and our face and our tongue. Okay. So, the precentral gyrus controls motor. Postcentral gyrus is for sensory. Uh, language and emotion, where is that controlled? Uh, language is controlled at the Wernicke area. That's posterior to the lateral circus on the left side of the brain. So quiz questions would be, okay, where, what is what and where is it found? Speech, uh, that's in the left side of the brain. So if you had a stroke on the left side of the brain, your speech may be affected. Okay. Emotion, there's, uh, there's quite a few areas. Uh, the amygdala outputs the hypothalamus and prefrontal cortex. Cognition and memory, acquire and use knowledge. There's quite a few of associated areas of cortex. Um, you have memory. You have two types of memory. You have procedural and declarative. Uh, limbic areas involved. The amygdala creates emotional memories. This is when a certain smell or a certain uh, place will bring back memories. Sometimes uh, a trauma. Uh, it's hard to get out of the amygdala. And then the hippocampus will consolidate your declarative long-term memories because we want short-term memory to go to long-term memories. Okay. And then, so here's the PET scan of the brain during performing the performance of a language task. So when you hear the word car, it's actually seen in the visual cortex first. So when you say car, your brain automatically thinks what a car is. And then the Wernicke area conceives of the verb drive to go with it. Okay, so this is all parts of the brain. And then the Broca area compiles a motor program to speak the word drive. And then the primary motor cor cortex executes the program and the word is spoken. Right, so this is, uh, it's crazy how, you, uh, how <coughs> involved your brain is. Okay, the word car is seen in the visual cortex. Wernicke area receives the verb drive to go with it. The Broca area compiles a motor program to speak the word drive. And the primary motor cortex executes the program and the word is spoken.